Welcome to Nordic by Nature, a podcast on ecology today, inspired by the Norwegian philosopher Arne Ness, who coined the term deep ecology. In this episode on transformation, we have one guest, Swedish social entrepreneur and co-author of The Nordic Secret, Thomas Björkman. After leaving the world of finance, Thomas established a foundation out on a beautiful island in the Stockholm archipelago. The foundation has the sole purpose of facilitating sustainable social transformation by nurturing the connections between personal and community development. Thomas is also the co-founder of the London-based research institute Perspectiva, and he has been a member of the Club of Rome since 2014. So I'm Thomas Björkman. I used to be a business entrepreneur, started uh, many different companies in IT, property, and in, in banking. And I was the chairman of this banking group, and I left business more or less completely in 2006, perhaps right in the middle of my life. And um, I started to think about what to do with the, with the second half of my life. Came to the conclusion that I wanted to start a foundation in uh, in Sweden, uh, a foundation that was built around the island of Ekvaret, which means the oak tree island, because I always felt that it was in nature where I could come in uh, good connection with uh, the deeper layers within myself. And as I wanted to make the purpose of my foundation the interrelationship between inner personal development and societal change, it was very natural for me to decide to base my foundation out in nature and use nature as a catalyst. After that, I, I've also started a, a small research institute in London called Perspectiva a few co-live and co-work initiatives, both in Stockholm and also in Berlin. I also managed to write um, three books. The first one is called The Market Myth, which really summarizes my inside view of uh, how the market in many ways is a very uh, good and efficient tool that helps create a lot of efficiency and value. But in other instances, it's not at all a good instrument to uh, rely on when it comes to creating uh, human uh, uh, well-being and societal well-being. So that was the market myth. My second book is called The World We Create, with an emphasis on we. There are many, many more aspects of the world than we usually think about that are actually human-created. I would say that perhaps 90% of the world we live in today is a human invention and could be radically different. One example of that is, of course, the market. 
which we tend to look at as a natural phenomenon, but which is really a human construct. And even the free market, if there ever would be such a thing, could essentially be completely different than it is today. And then uh, uh, my latest book, which I've written together with a Danish philosopher and friend, Lena Andersen, is called The Nordic Secret. And it's really about how the emphasis on inner personal development played an essential role for the Nordic countries to transition a hundred years ago from being the poorest non-democratic agrarian countries in, in Europe into just a few generations later the happiest, most wealthy, stable, industrial uh, democracies in, in the world. The story I tell in my book, The World We Create, is really the story of, of uh, uh, humanity from the very, very early uh, stages when we became humans, more or less, perhaps a couple of million years ago. The invention of fire, perhaps half a million years ago, to the start of culture, perhaps 50,000 years ago. And the ongoing story about technological evolution. And of course, humanity has taken many big steps in the technological evolution. Say, the invention of agriculture was uh, something that completely changed uh, the way we lived and related. And we started to build huge cities and empires on the back of, uh, of agriculture. So technological development is nothing new. But today, the speed of technological development is at such a rate that we've never seen anything like that before. And that creates a lot of problems, a lot of stress. But also, of course, it's the technological development that we have to thank for all the, um, well, for the beautiful lives that we can live today compared to our uh, ancestors. Even looking at my own grandparents when they were teenagers, the world that they were living in back then was such a poor and difficult world that the world that we are living in today, and when I say we, I I don't just mean the few uh, percent of the human population in in the rich countries, but really I would say that perhaps even 90% of the world's population today live in a world that my own grandparents, when they were teenagers, would just think was a fantastic dream world. And I think that the Enlightenment, that was really the last time when we had a very substantial transition in both society and in worldview. We have the um, Enlightenment and the scientific approach to the world to thank for this development. But also, and at the same time, I think that the many problems that we see today, many, many of the human-made problems that humanity is facing today, is actually now caused by exactly that same worldview, this rationalistic, scientific worldview. All these different crises that we see today... Of course, we have the environmental crisis, which might even be the most urgent crisis we have today. But we also seem to be entering into a very severe political crisis. We certainly have health issues on a scale that we haven't seen before, not the least the, uh, for example, the obesity crisis in many parts of the world, not just the the rich West now. We have the... um, 
opiatic uh, crisis in the U.S. We have everywhere in the West the um, psychological ill health crisis, and we have the inequality crisis that is both an increased inequality within countries, but also between countries. And all of these crises, I think, are not different crises. They are actually uh, symptoms on one underlying, which we could call a meta-crisis of our time. Humanity has many times before gone through these uh, radical transformations, both of worldview and of, uh, of, of society. But this transformation that we are now going through is different from the previous ones in three major aspects. The first one is the speed of transformation. The second one is uh, the global impact on environment. And the third one is the possibility of going from a world of scarcity to a world of abundance, of well-being. Not necessarily material abundance, but abundance of well-being. If I take a minute to unpack each of them, so starting with the, the rate of change, before, say when we went from uh, an agricultural society to an industrial society, we usually had the possibility to make that transition or adapt to these changes between generations. So perhaps my grandfather was a farmer and his father was a farmer. But then when Industrial Revolution happened, his sons and daughters might have given up farming and moved to the city, whereas uh, my grandfather and grandmother could remain farmers for the rest of their life. Now technology shifts that fast that we actually in our own lifetime have to reinvent ourselves many times. And if you just think back on your own life, even if you are not that old, you could think about how many completely different technological worlds have you actually already lived in. I remember a world before uh, television. Then, of course, we had the uh, introduction of mobile phones. The world before mobile phones and after mobile phones are com completely different worlds. And then of the personal computing and then internet and then uh, the, the smartphones. And each of these technological steps have really been that significant that you have had to both reinvent your business and business models, but also your, uh, your private life to a large extent. So say that we now live in a world where we might have to reinvent our lives and our careers every 10 years. Soon that will be every fifth year, and then it might be every second year. And this is not very far away. And of course, that will put a lot of psychological stress on us. Our brains are not evolved. So far in the history of humanity, we have had the possibility, most of us, to live in the world that we were actually born into. So that's the first one. The second important shift is, of course, that we are moving from uh, a world where we humans did not have a significant impact on the global climate. We might have uh, exploited and overused our local natural resources, but then we had the, perhaps the possibility to move on and nature could heal. Now the uh, impact that we as humans have on climate is on a global scale. And again, our brains are not really evolved to, uh, to see this, 
that is one of the problems that we have today, that uh, we do not, in an emotional way, perceive the way we are uh, destroying nature. We did not impact nature in that way, so we did not have any reason to develop these feelings. And now when we, when we need them, we are lacking them. And that is why for many people this environmental um, catastrophe that we are entering into does not really move them emotionally. That's the second shift. And then the third one is that we have, throughout evolution, been living in a world of competition and of scarcity And our minds are really hardwired for scarcity. But also our economic systems and our society is wired for scarcity. So for the market, for example, to function, you need to have a a limited supply that meets the demand. So also the market needs scarcity. Whereas hopefully, with the technological development, if we distribute that wealth in a just fashion, then we already today have enough wealth for all of us to be living very decent lives. And again, lives that my grandparents, when they were teenagers, could only dream of. Some experts say that we are really already there, that if we could just distribute all the wealth that our current economic and technological system uh, produces. Of course, we will not all be able to drive um, cars and consume uh, material goods at, at the level that we do in the West today. But still, there is enough for everyone to be able to live a life in uh, an abundance of well-being. That is, of course, good news. If we are entering into a world where we as humans do not need to work 40 hours a week, 40 years of our lives. But if you look upon this possibility through the lens of the labor market, what you then see is the threat of massive unemployment. So again, we can't approach a world of potential abundance with a mindset and social systems that are geared and developed around the concept of scarcity. So these three major challenges, technological shift, environmental threat, and the possibility to go from a world of scarcity to abundance, that really the uh, challenge and the tipping point and the hurdle that humanity needs to pass through right now. For that to happen in a good way, I think that we need to both have a change of mind and a change of heart. And when I speak about a change of mind, I'm thinking about the worldview that we have today, the Enlightenment worldview, the reductionist worldview, the scientific worldview. We shouldn't give that worldview up completely because it is very helpful, especially in in some situations, but it definitely needs to be complemented with other ways of looking at ourselves and society and the world. We also need to have this change of heart, which is an inner change of uh, opening up to these greater possibilities of us humans. You could talk there about a, a... a development of the heart, a development of compassion, a development of consciousness. You can describe this in many different ways, and one way to describe them is really our need to develop what some might call transformative skills. And that's really the skill sets that we need both as individuals to be able to survive and and to flourish in this very new world, but that also is essential for humanity when it comes to navigating this um, great societal uh, transition that I think that we are just starting to see the beginning of. 
So if we should look a little bit deeper into these different groups or clusters of transformative skills, it's a bit arbitrary how you would cluster them and put them under various headlines. But one way to do it is to talk about the cluster of openness, the cluster of perspective seeking, the cluster of sense making, the cluster around our inner world and developing and coming into contact with our inner compass, and then finally a cluster around compassion. That could include uh, things like empathy, compassion, and, and self-compassion and other forms. If you study these clusters of skills from a scientific perspective, the good news is that science has shown quite consistently that all of these skills can be developed. So, for example, you are not born with a certain amount of uh, empathy or openness or ability to seek different perspectives. They can be developed. The bad news is that uh, they can't be taught in the standard way of sort of school teaching. So, for example, if you in your organization have someone that needs to develop more empathy or compassion, you could not just send him or her on a three-day course in compassion and then they come back with a new amount of uh, compassion developed. No, it doesn't work like that. So these transformative skills really need a form of learning that involves deeper psychological processes, many or most of them um, subconscious processes. Some uh, researchers call that form of learning that is necessary transformative learning. It is learning that somehow transforms the way you, you see the world and how you generate emotions. It's somehow a transformation of, of your mind and of your, of your heart. And again, going back to the work of my foundation, we have found, and I have personally found, that being out in nature and being in close contact with nature actually can function very well as a catalyst for um, transformative learning. And I think we will a bit later in the podcast talk about my book, or uh, my Lena's book, The, the Nordic Secret. Yeah, I'm coming to that. Yeah, and um, in this rapidly changing world where we do not know which will be my next step in career, how will I have to reinvent myself, then a safe bet is always that we will be needing more and more of these transformative skills. So if I would give an advice to anyone who is right in the middle of their career and worried about, uh, about the future and their employability in the future, I would say if you look at developing these sorts of transformative deeper skills, they will always be needed. And the same for your children. We do not know what the labor market will look like in 10 years, even less in 20 years. Here in Sweden, uh, politicians are, are today talking about that we should all learn programming. But the experts tell me that uh, programming is one of the first tasks that will be automated by uh, artificial intelligence. I would say that these transformative skills, these deeper skills, they will always be in, in demand. I would uh, put a strong emphasis on them. So if this is on the skill side, then I was also mentioning that we need to have a shift in worldview. And again, the last time we had this huge shift in worldview, that was when we went from a uh, religious dogmatic way of looking at the world, to start to look at the world through a, a rational, scientific worldview. And that was a drastic change in worldview. And I think we are right now in the need of an equally drastic change. This time, I don't think it's about giving up the scientific worldview. I think it's about complementing the scientific worldview and perhaps integrating the insights of both the scientific worldview, but also perhaps the religious or a spiritual worldview that is putting much, much more emphasis on our inner world and uh, our capacity for uh, meaning-making. 
and complement that also with the latest insights from perhaps the postmodern worldview, which contains very important insights about uh, hidden power structures in society and the way that our human society is socially constructed. So I think going forward, and the new worldview will contain many lenses through which we need to uh, see the world. To be even more specific, uh, I could talk about five shifts in worldview that I think that we uh, need to uh, consider. The first one would be to go away from looking at ourselves as just isolated individuals, these utility-maximizing individuals that economic theory uh, have us believe that we are, to start realizing that we are all, as humans, very, very much more interconnected and interdependent on each other. Just maximizing my, my own happiness or my own utility is really not possible. My happiness is dependent on the happiness of people around myself, and we are all interconnected. So that could be one shift in worldview. A second one could be to realize that in many, many cases, it's much, much more fruitful to look upon phenomenon in this world, not as things, but as ongoing processes, and to start to realize that most of the phenomena in our world are actually self-organizing, developing systems, applying a systems view on the world, an evolutionary systems view on the world could be very fruitful. The next shift would be in the view of our mind, going away from, again, the Enlightenment philosopher's view of our mind as a rational decision-making machine, to start realizing that our mind is actually also one of these constantly developing complex systems that are under the development throughout our lives, and that this development can either be facilitated or hindered by our environment. And then number four would be to go from a view of our society as more or less something given to start realizing that we are actually all co-creators of society and that society is something that is socially constructed by all of us. Whether we are aware of it or not, we are either replicating or constructing society. Once we become aware of the fact that we are all co-creators of our social reality or our, of our collective imaginary, then of course that is very empowering, but also giving us a huge responsibility in the ways that we create this social reality. And then finally, the, the fifth shift in worldview, I think will have to be around the view of our lives, and start realizing that more is not necessarily better and move away from a focus on development, life, and progress in mainly material terms of a material growth and material wealth to start realizing that inner matters like purpose and meaning becomes very, very important. And of course, if you start to see the world from these new perspectives, you, you start seeing a completely uh, different world. Many of the political decisions and the structures and the, and the struggles and the fights that we see today all of a sudden makes absolutely no sense whatsoever.
this development of these transformative skills that I was talking about, that has actually happened before. We have a very interesting uh, historical case in the development of the Nordic countries and how we as societies went from being in the middle of the 1800s, the most poor uh, agrarian, non-democratic societies in Europe. In Sweden, actually 30% of the working population emigrated to the US because of the severe conditions in, in Sweden back then. And then we developed in just a few generations, even before the Second World War, all the Nordic countries were at the top of uh, the list when it came to the happiest, richest, most stable industrial democracies. The question one could ask is, of course, what made this possible? The interesting story that Lena and I tell in the Nordic Secret is that we actually back then in the Nordic countries, in all of the Nordic countries, had very visionary uh, intellectuals and politicians. And they, and they could see that change coming, of course, because they saw the Industrial Revolution happening in the UK and on the continent, and they knew that urbanization and industrialization was coming to the Scandinavian countries. And they knew that in such situations of societal change, it's so easy for us humans to uh, start looking for something to hold on to in the, ex in the external world. You want to find something to which you can put your uh, hope. And that could be a dogmatic religion or it could be a strong authoritarian leader. It could be an Erdogan or a Trump. These visionary uh, politicians were firmly committed to building democratic societies. They knew that the only way to build strong democracies is to build them from bottom up. And in order to do that, you need a substantial part of the population to actually be able to hold the complexity of rapid social change without needing an external authority. You needed a large part of the population to be enough grounded in themselves to be in contact with their own inner compass in order to become conscious co-creators of the new world that wanted to be born. And the way they went about to create these co-creators, enabled co-creators, emancipated co-creators, was quite extraordinary. They created what we could call uh, retreat centers, retreat centers for inner growth to develop these transformative skills. So uh, at the turn of the last century, year 1900 about, they were actually 100 of these centers created in Denmark, 75 in Norway and 150 in Sweden. In most of the cases, these centers were located out in nature and we're using nature as a transformative catalyst in these processes. Here, young uh, adults in their early uh, 20s, and back then you had probably been working uh, a few years before you went to one of these, and you could spend up to six months at these retreat centers, later on with full state subsidy, with the expressed aim of finding your inner compass, becoming enough grounded in yourself to be able to act as conscious co-creators of modernity. In addition to developing your own inner compass, you were also given basic tools to create civic society organizations, how to start an NGO, how to write a speech, how to write a, an article, how to argue for your case. And also you learned the latest technological development in industry or in craft in order for you to be able to embrace the technological developments and, and not be afraid of them. And when this was at its height, almost a hundred years ago from now, say around the 1920s or something like that, then 10% of each young generation in Sweden actually had the opportunity to go to one of these half-year long retreats. And this was everywhere in the population. This was very much working class and farming part of the population that took part of these retreats. So everywhere in society, 
you had people who had enough inner guidance and stability to be able to act as co-creators of modernity and of the democratic society. And still today in Scandinavia, we see the effects of this massive scale uh, resources de devoted to inner personal development. This Nordic secret is actually a secret also to ourselves because we lost the uh, notion of the importance of the inner world at, at around the time of uh, the Second World War. We became very uh, positivistic, very scientific, and uh, we more or less started to look at the inner world, our subjectivity, more as a problem than as a possibility. So today, even in our history books, these uh, centers are not described as centers for consciousness development or development of transformative skills. They are more or less described as adult educational centers. And they still exist today, and, and they are called uh, folk high schools. And they still receive a massive state funding, but their activities are more in the realm of um, updating your basic schooling or doing crafts or cultural activities. So where did this uh, understanding from these early politicians and intellectuals in Scandinavia come from? So how did they know the importance of our inner world and also the connection between the inner um, development and societal development? And the answer there is that this understanding came from the German idealists, philosophers that were writing uh, at the beginning of the 1800s. Philosophers like uh, Goethe, Schiller, Herder, von Humboldt, Hegel, and all of these philosophers, they were actually writing and reacting against the Enlightenment philosophers' view of our mind as a rational decision-making machine. The view of our mind of, for example, John Locke or René Descartes. Our mind is actually an organic system that is uh, embodied in the totality of our bodies. So our mind is not just in our brain. Our mind is embodied in the totality of our bodies. Our mind is also embedded and very dependent on the cultural environment. And these views of our mind uh, are actually now more and more being confirmed by both contemporary developmental psychology, but also contemporary uh, uh, mind research. Our minds are actually embodied in the totality of our bodies and dependent on and uh, embedded in our culture. And they also knew that a very important step in this lifelong development of our mind is the step that some of us take as adults, not all of us, in shifting from becoming external directed to becoming inner directed. Most people were still looking for an external authority. So for, for democracy to really develop, you need to have a substantial part of the population, not, not necessarily a majority, but a substantial part of the population to be enough grounded in themselves and be in contact with their own inner compass for democracy to work. And that is exactly what the politicians, the early democratic politicians in Scandinavia and the intellectuals uh, took note of. And that is why they created these centers, these educational centers for transformative skills, for consciousness development, and not the least developing this inner compass. And it actually worked. We have forgotten about this history and we are starting to lose this uh, a little bit. Up until today, we have uh, forgotten about the importance of our, of our inner world and we are not any longer talking about consciousness uh, development or lifelong development of our mind. We've forgotten about these transformative uh, skills and the importance to actually actively cultivate, for example, compassion.
But I see now in Scandinavia a bit of an awakening and a bit of a re-realization of this importance of the inner world. And that is coming from perhaps an unexpected place, coming from the corporate world, actually, because people in the corporate world are um, seriously concerned about the abilities of their organizations to keep up with this rapidly uh, changing uh, technological and social uh, environment. This puts a lot of strains both on the corporations, but also to all those individuals within the corporations. Quite a few uh, HR departments are starting to realize that it is not just necessary to focus on the maturation and inner development of the top management. But now a realization is starting to grow that in order for organizations to be adaptable enough and agile enough to uh, constantly reinvent themselves in this rapidly changing technological and social environment, these skills are now skills that everyone in the organization needs to develop. So then if this was so important in the corporate world and in corporate literature and management consultants and in executive training, why did we not at all talk about this in the same way in in society or societal development? I hope that these uh, insights will uh, spread rapidly out in uh, society. I think, if not the least, the environmental uh, catastrophe that we are facing makes it absolutely necessary to, uh, again, look at uh, internal development and consciousness development uh, on a societal scale. This becomes a major concern for not just corporations, but for society. And there I think, and there I hope, that... uh, the Nordic countries, again, can play a leading role. So if I should say something about the uniqueness of of the Scandinavian model, I I would use the... um, analogy with uh, with an organization and these new self-organizing organization. Some people talk about that in the new organization have to be a deliberately developmental organization, a DDO, where the organization actually supports the development of all individuals within the organization to reach their full potential. And I think that the Scandinavian um, model, originally, a hundred years ago, the vision was to create a deliberately developmental society, a DDS, a society which actively supported every individual's, every citizen's possibility to reach their full potential. And I think in that rapidly developing world, we need to somehow come back to that. It's not just the uh, our tech companies that need to compete on an international uh, market that needs to become deliberately developmental organizations. I think all nations now need to become deliberately developmental societies. And I think that that was really at the core of the Scandinavian model we can at least have a vision about what is a good process and how do we create that good process of moving forward. And I think there is where we need to have the democratic debate today and there is where we need to have a vision. And again, I think part of that vision is already today creating a deliberately developmental society where as many people as possible in society can become and really feel liberated, emancipated, and empowered to be able to participate in the creation 
of the future world, in the creation of the world that we together create. Thank you for listening. You can find more information about Thomas Bjorkman and his foundation on his website, tomas-bjorkman.com. A transcript of this podcast is available on imaginarylife.net slash podcast. Please help us by sharing a link to this episode with the hashtag Traces of North and follow us on Instagram at Nordic by Nature Podcast. If you would like to support us with a small donation, please see patreon.com slash Nordic by Nature. Nordic by Nature Podcast is an imaginarylife.net production in partnership with the Foundation for the Contemplation of Nature. If you would like to find out more information about the Foundation for the Contemplation of Nature, please see foundnature.org. The music and sound has been designed by Diego Losa. You can find him on diegolosa.blogspot.com. Please don't hesitate to write to us on info at imaginarylife.net. <laughs>